thank you so much for giving us all the opportunity to speak with you. Um, so I guess my first question is, what has been the most influential uh, thing about William and Mary, whether that be a professor um, or an activity that you've had at the college that has really influenced you in your career, not only at the CIA, but also the Department of Defense? Well, I think um, two things. First of all, there were a number of faculty who had a big impact on me here. Uh, but also, I think just the whole nature of the experience here, and particularly the emphasis on teaching and and having cl classes that were small enough that, other than the lecture classes of the freshmen, uh, that there was a real dialogue in the, in the classroom uh, among the students, between the students and the faculty. Uh, and so a lot of give and take in terms of figuring out how to listen to people, how to respect other people's point of view, maybe learn from other people. Uh, and I, you know, you go to high school and you grow up in a very narrow environment. Pretty much everybody in your high school is just like you are. And you come to a place like William & Mary where you have people from all over the country and certainly now from all over the world. And and that's just a huge broadening experience of its own. I and mean, when I came here in 1961 from Kansas, everybody assumed I'd grown up on a farm. And they asked me if there was cattle rustling and stuff like that. But, uh, so it, 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 I think it was a combination of those two things. Now, you've had a, a storied career and a very busy career and a busy schedule, and now you're chancellor of the College of William & Mary. Congratulations on that. Um, but if you were asked again to serve um, under a president, would you be willing to go do that again? Well, I learned a long time ago never to say never, but I cannot imagine the circumstances under <laughs> which that would happen. Um, no, I, I think the time has come for the baton to be passed. Uh, I think I realized that when I realized that uh, I was older than the last two presidents that I, that I served, one by eight years and one by 20 years. <laughs> um, you're the first alumnus in, a couple, in recent years to be elected as chancellor of the college. So um, many students are hoping that this has like a renewed influence on campus, this position as chancellor. What plans do you have? Well, the, the guy who became chancellor when I was a student was uh, Alvin Duke Chandler, who I guess was a retired admiral. And, and we students all figured that's why so many of the buildings inside were painted gray. And he'd gotten some kind of a special deal from the Navy on gray paint. But we never saw him. And I, I confess that this first year, uh, I will do this and I will be here at commencement. Uh, but I've contracted with Knopf to write a book, and it's due a year from now. And so I expect to be uh, pecking away on that pretty busily. But my hope is that um, that perhaps beginning in 2013 I can spend a few days here in the fall and um, as well as a few days here in, around Charter Day uh, and, and maybe uh, from time to time on other occasions depending on when I get back to the East Coast. But, uh, anyway, I wanna, I mean, one of the reasons that I agreed to do it was uh, I really enjoyed being the president of Texas A&M and not only the opportunity to come and reconnect with uh, William & Mary, but also to reestablish a, a kind of regular uh, connection with both faculty and students. So I certainly look forward to doing as much as I can. Um, well, you sort of mentioned before um, your relationship with professors and stuff, but what was your time like here as a student? Like what, what did you do? What, well, I, um, my father and my parents uh, did not want me to come back east to school. And my father and I argued about it from the time I was about 15, because I was 17 when I came here. And um, so I finally won the argument. My, my father, my brother is eight years older than I am and went to Kansas State University. So my dad said, so I'll give you the same amount of money I gave your brother, which was $1,500 a year. 
and so I I worked when I was here every semester except my very first semester and uh, uh, you know I was active uh, in several groups here on campus but uh, there were several of us also that served as assistant scoutmasters at the, for the Boy Scout Troop at First Methodist Church across the way. And, um, I went to St. Stephen's Church. Um, so I, you know, between school and working and these other things, I kept pretty busy. And I was also a dorm manager uh, for, uh, uh, because that pretty much paid for the, the dorm room. So I was basically looking to cut costs for everybody. <laughs> so I, I, you know, like everybody, I, I kept really busy. I, it's kind of interesting. I got the Alger on Sydney Sullivan Award uh, when I graduated, and, and I always uh, told myself that it was kind of by default, because in those days nobody was active in the community. Nobody did anything with the community. When I was on the endowment board back in the '90s. I was just staggered by how engaged everybody on campus seemed to be uh, in volunteer work and, and so on. So it was really awesome. But, uh, but I was kind of alone. The good news is that uh, between the scout troop and the school bus, uh, I got offered a lot of home cooked dinners. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Uh, I was just going to ask uh, what it feels like to return to your alma mater as such a distinguished alumnus. Well, I've um, I've been back here several times. Uh, I was here for Charter Day and speaker for Charter Day in 1998, and um, gave the commencement address in May of 2007. Mm -hmm. And we came back here. Uh, we, my wife and I, came down either in 08 or 09, just for some private time. You know, stayed over at the lodge, but I walked the campus so. I don't actually feel like I ever really lost touch with the campus. As I said, I served several years on the endowment board in the mid-90s. Um, um, but obviously, you know, you, you think back to when you were a freshman. And you never dream that any of these things that happen in your life will have happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, much less that you'll even live to be that old. So. <laughs> Kurt. Um, I have a question about your career. So that's always fascinating to me about what you did as Secretary of Defense is the time you came in, uh, the heat of the Iraq War, and sort of changing the uh, strategy of the United States from Secretary Roosevelt. Can you talk a little bit about sort of going into the grain that you had to do? Well, my, um, it was clear to me from my confirmation hearings, as well as my conversation with President Bush, uh, my interview with President Bush, that my priority was to turn the situation around in Iraq because we were in real trouble uh, at the end of 2006. And um, so we started with a new commander, with General Petraeus. Uh, and within weeks of, of um, um, becoming secretary, I'd increase the um, size of the Army by 65,000. Marine Corps by 27,000 because I think we thought we were asking too much of those that we were already in. Um, and then and then people, that we had not gotten the right kinds of equipment to our troops. And mainly because everybody assumed it would be a short war. And so nobody wanted to make investments in equipment or technologies that were not part of their long range uh, programs. Uh, and and we were losing so many uh, troops to these improvised explosive devices. Uh, and I read an article in USA Today in February or March of 2007 that Marines had uh, about 75 of these what they called mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, MRAPs. And there had been 300 attacks and not a single Marine had been killed. I said, I want those. Uh, and so we we launched a program, and we ended up building 26,000 MRAPs at a cost of $30 billion. But 
they saved thousands of lives and thousands of limbs. And there were a lot of stories about MRAPs being attacked by IEDs and all the soldiers walking away. And uh, so I think the opportunity to not only change the strategy, but to get the equipment right in terms of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, the armor, uh, and kind of everything, the medical care. And, and I basically, my approach was take more prisoners. Um, and so when the Walter Reed scandal erupted, I fired the Secretary of the Army, the Surgeon General of the Army, and the commander of the hospital. Um, and that let people know that I was serious. But it, it um, you know, I, it really was pushing against the bureaucracy in the department. And the subtitle of my book is a memoir of a secretary of war. What's the title? And the duty. And and my, my my principal theme is that I wasn't just at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I was at war with the Congress. I was at war with the White House. I was at war with other agencies. And I was at war with the Department of Defense in terms of turning this thing around. And um, so it was a busy time. Catherine? <laughs> um, so um, today, with the economy in its um, current state, many like university students are feeling a pressure to um, focus on practical majors rather than studying the liberal arts. And as someone who holds a um, doctoral degree in history, what do you think is the value of studying the humanities, the arts, and the pure sciences? Well, I think that. Um, You know, for me, <laughs> first of all, you're looking at a guy who got a D in freshman calculus. So, uh, um, but I, I think that, um, you know, that's what our, our, our civilization uh, is not a civilization because of our technology. Um, it is because of languages and the arts, uh, knowledge of our history, and frankly, I think there are way too many uh, in Washington and in the media and elsewhere who don't know anything about history, and it's a danger. Um, and and I, part of the reason I knew it was time to leave was that uh, I ended up having to give a history lesson, it seemed like, every time we were in the Situation Room. Uh, you know, this happened this way, and if you did it this way, and so on and so forth. And, but I, I just think that... Um, you have to have both the hard sciences and the soft sciences, and and frankly, the cutbacks on the soft sciences, uh, I think, will will have an impact on uh, the quality of life uh, for people. Um, you have served under both a Republican president and a Democratic president, um, and as Secretary of Defense. What was the biggest difference between serving under President Bush and President Obama? And with the 2012 election coming up, will you be endorsing a candidate? Well, the answer to the last question is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, you know, people say, well, gosh, how can you work with people that was as different as Bush and Obama? And I said, well, you forget I worked for Carter and Reagan. Uh, in terms of, you know, you want to talk about really big differences yeah. between two presidents? Um, I, I think partly the biggest difference was when I served them. I served President Bush in the last two years of his administration. Neither he nor the Vice President were ever going to run for office again. All the politicos and the ideologues were long gone. He knew he'd made his historical bed. and and kind of realized there wasn't anything he could do about it at that point. So it was a different environment than in the first term. Obama, obviously like every president, wants to serve a second term. And so the first term, just like every other president, lots of issues get looked at through a political prism. How will it affect the prospects for re-election? I'm confident it was exactly the same way in the first term of the Bush administration. And, and you know, the only politician, or the only president, uh, actually the, the only two presidents that I worked for who really didn't think about re-election and didn't sort of structure the White House 
as a, as a campaign machine were President Ford and the first President Bush, and it's telling neither one of them got reelected. I think we're probably time for one more. Uh, Allie, did you wish? Um, you've obviously, the college has changed a lot since you were here. Um, what do you hope now as Chancellor for the future of the college? What's one thing that you'd like to see happen? Well, I, you know, that's, that's really the, uh, the Board of Visitors and President Reevely, and I am going to be very disciplined about remembering what my role is here. <laughs> um, I think, I think whatever I, a couple of things. First, whatever I can do to uh, reinforce the the priority here at this college on undergraduate education and undergraduate teaching. I think it's I think it's one of the uh, one of the college's most uh, significant uh, characteristics. And then the other is uh, as state support continues to decline, um, and probably different than any of my predecessors, having been the president of a huge public university. I, I really see the important, importance of development efforts and of contributions of uh, alumni and, and others in terms of helping make up uh, for the loss of uh, state funding. Maybe not in operations, but in terms of uh, endowed professorships, uh, endowed scholarships, things like that. So what I've told the various boards and President Reevely and the rector was that uh, to the degree I can be helpful on the on the development side, I'm willing to do that. Thank you all. Now we're